bigger, lighter and sharper in its reactions. The second generation Range Rover Sport has come of age, frightening German luxury SUV rivals by at last matching them on tarmac while still obliterating them off-road. No longer a dressed up discovery, it now shares plenty with the fully fledged limousine-like Range Rover, but is able to bring much of that car's high technology to a wider audience. Here's a car that claims to be able to do, well, almost everything. It'll cruise on the Autobahn at 130 miles an hour, ford rivers in the Serengeti, take a family of seven on holiday, and slip you down to the shops. It's affordable to run, rewarding to drive, and looks dynamic and stylish. There has to be a catch, doesn't there? Time to check out the second generation Range Rover Sport. Ah yes, the Range Rover Sport, a car that in its original guise was neither a Range Rover or sporty. In fact, it was based almost entirely on the brand's sensible Discovery model and thanks to that car's practical ladder frame chassis, about as dynamic to drive. Still, the smarter set of clothes did the trick and for most of its life between 2005 and 2012, the Sport was Solihull's best seller. There were, it turned out, a vast number of potential buyers who liked the idea of a Range Rover but either couldn't afford one or wanted something a bit sportier. Something like this, in other words, the car, the concept always promised, but never quite delivered. Appropriately, its very existence is at last properly inspired and in many ways completely made possible by the fully fledged Range Rover. Back in 2012, that car was completely redeveloped in fourth generation form with aluminium underpinnings, sharper handling and hybrid power. Engineering eagerly seized upon by the Range Rover Sport development team in their quest to at last be able to offer a credibly sporting SUV rival to cars like the Porsche Cayenne and the BMW X5. These two competitors, of course, don't have to blend in unrivaled off-road excellence with their back-road blasting. They don't have to be automotive Swiss army knives, all things to all people, in quite the same way. So, burdened with such expectations, how can this Range Rover, how can any Range Rover take them on at their own game? That's what we're here to find out. A Range Rover of any kind tends to fill you with certain expectations. It'll seat you higher up than anything in its segment, will lumber pleasantly about, roll a little through the bends and storm its way through just about anything you can throw at it off-road. All of this is of course good enough for the Land Rover faithful, but it isn't an especially tempting proposition for the Teutonic brand buyers Solihull urgently needs to satisfy for stronger sales. The first generation Range Rover Sport didn't tempt away enough of them, but the thinking was that this Mark II model might, uh, if it could be lighter, more agile and faster. If it could really be what designer Jerry McGovern calls the Porsche 911 of SUVs. The original version of this car had no chance of even considering such a demanding brief, mainly because it weighed nearly three tonnes. Not any more it doesn't, thanks to an exacting diet and primarily to an aluminium monocoque chassis borrowed from the fully fledged Range Rover then redeveloped for this model, a massive 420 kilograms has been saved from the curb weight, equivalent to a car full of adults each carrying a hefty suitcase. Even if you didn't know this, even if you weren't expecting the enormous difference this ought to make, the feel that you get at the wheel in what's called the sports command driving position anticipates a very different, far more involving driving experience than was ever delivered by this car's predecessor. The steering wheel's smaller, the seats are grippier, and the full fat Range Rover's ponderous rising circular gear selector is here replaced by a purposeful shard-like stick, which seems to have been borrowed from Jaguar's F-Type sports car. It controls the eight-speed ZF Auto gearbox that all sport models must have, whether they be diesel, petrol, or even hybrid powered. 
which makes it sound like there's quite a choice. Though the reality is that the vast majority of buyers will end up behind the wheel of the variant that I'm trying here, the 292 PS SD V6 diesel. That's mainly because this is the only version of this car you can mechanically specify just as you want, including or deleting key driving features like the twin speed low range gearbox, the latest automatic version of the terrain response system and a whole arsenal of on tarmac driver aids that improve response and sharpen up cornering. Now, none of this is even optional on the entry-level 258 PS TD V6 diesel. And at the other extreme, you have to have it all, whether you like it or not, on the three pricey, powerful models you'll find at the top of the lineup. The diesel hybrid, the 339 PS diesel SD V8, and the frighteningly fast 510 PS 5 litre supercharged petrol V8. Think of the entry-level TD V6 version of this car as a kind of Range Rover Sport light kind of experience. It's there to give the Solihull brand a car to compete directly on price with rival Mercedes M-Class and BMW X5 models, which isn't easy given that it must still be based on high-tech Range Rover aluminium underpinnings which therefore originate from a far more exalted model that frequently sells for up to six figures. What it all meant was that something had to give in the TDV6 tech spec to keep costs down and the sticker figure competitive. Two main things actually. For on-road use, you don't get the adaptive dynamics continuously variable dampers that are fitted elsewhere across the range and help this car set a new standard for comfort in this class. Now these automatically monitor ride quality and vehicle movements 500 times a second to ensure that the suspension always suits the road that you're on and the mood that you're in. There are off-road cutbacks too. There's no heavy-duty four-wheel drive system in the TDV6 variant, merely a simpler Torsen setup that can't be locked in the 50-50 front torque split mode that serious off-roaders use to ease themselves out of the stickiest situations. Which isn't necessarily a problem. We all know, of course, that most typical Range Rover Sport customers aren't serious off-roaders. Indeed, they're people who may well be quite pleased to be able to buy a lighter, simpler version of this car. They'll point out that thanks to 600 newton meters of torque, a TD V6 variant still has the same 3,500 kilogram towing limit that applies to any other conventional sport model. And they'll remind you that the car is still more than adequately rapid. 62 miles an hour from rest, 7.6 seconds away en route to 130 miles an hour. But for all that, I can't help thinking that TDV6 buyers will be missing something in not stretching up to the SDV6 level in this car. Not, it must be said, with respect to on-paper performance. That's pretty much the same. More in terms of the way it can be achieved, providing, of course, you tick the right boxes. One box in particular, actually, and it's called Dynamic. Yes, order a Dynamic Spec SD V6 variant and you'll add around 10% to the cost of your car. No, you won't regret it if you do. The on-road features included uh, make this as much of a sports car as any hefty luxury SUV is ever going to be. And whereas the original version of this model wouldn't even begin to keep up with a well-driven Porsche Cayenne or BMW X5 on a twisting country road, a Mark II Range Rover Sport in dynamic spec can do just that. Whilst at the same time embarrassing both of those two cars and everything else in the segment, off-road, thanks to the low-range gearbox and auto-terrain response system that I mentioned earlier. Both features added in to dynamic spec models. Want a little more detail, re the on-road dynamic spec stuff? I should probably give you that since uh, this car will spend nearly all its life on tarmac. Essentially, there are three main features that make the difference. And let's start with cornering, traditionally the roly-poly downside of SUV motoring. Not here it isn't. Dynamic response active lean control 
does exactly what it promises, working independently on the front and rear axles to dramatically reduce body roll, encouraging you to press a little harder into tight bends and enjoy a torque vectoring system which works with what Land Rover calls a dynamic active rear locking differential to fire you from bend to bend. Now, both features combine through the turns to counter both understeer and wheel spin, with the electronics lightly micro-braking whichever front wheel is threatening to lose grip. As a result, the car's kept planted, more of the power gets transmitted onto the tarmac, and you feel more in control. Reassuring, I'd say, especially if you happen to be at the wheel of one of the more powerful models. The SD V8 diesel manages 62 miles an hour from rest in 6.9 seconds, while the 5 litre supercharged petrol model trims that back to 5.3 seconds, with the standard versions of both variants charging on to 140 miles an hour flat out. Both are models that will probably also see owners make good use of the third tarmac trick this car has up its sleeve, its dynamic program. Now, you'll find this on the Terrain Response 2 system you activate via the circular dial down here below the gear stick. It's a one-shot setting that, when selected, instantly switches everything into red mist mode. So, in one hit, you get a sharper throttle response, more responsive steering, quicker gear changes, tighter body control, and a firmer ride from the standard air suspension. Brilliant. None of which would be especially praiseworthy if, like its rivals, Land Rover had compromised this car's off-road excellence in search of asphalt acceptability. But it hasn't. Even the least capable TD V6 sport models are engineered to survive in the wild with two key features. First, there's a completely redeveloped lightweight air suspension setup that in terms of wheel travel and articulation betters any other SUV save for the fully fledged Range Rover. The air springs can now raise the car even higher for really rough services which is why this model's 278mm maximum ground clearance figure is a massive 51mm more than the first generation version of this design could offer. And you can keep the high off-road suspension setting active at higher speed, up to 50 miles an hour, which is a real boon when you're on terrain with long, rutted dirt roads. The increased height is an obvious advantage in water. It accounts for the enormous 850mm wading capability you can monitor via an optional wade sensing feature that shows you the depth of the water that you're driving through. A visual display and warning chimes alert the driver as the water level rises around the vehicle. And while we're talking about how high this car can get off the ground, we should also mention how that facilitates an impressive approach angle of 33 degrees that'll get you up steep slopes. And once you've used the standard hill descent control to ease you down them again, you'll be glad of a useful departure angle of 31 degrees. The second key mud plugging feature that I want to mention is Land Rover's acclaimed terrain response system, which in its most basic form offers a choice of three selectable settings to suit the ground that you're covering. Uh, there's grass, gravel, snow, there's sand, or there's mud ruts. Now, other rivals have copied this, so the Solihull engineers have developed an upgraded so-called Terrain Response 2 Auto package that goes a little further with two extra settings. Rock Crawl does what it promises, but I think most useful is the Auto Mode, which analyzes the conditions that you're driving in, then automatically selects the most suitable terrain program to cope. It can also tell you when to use the low range gearbox, which as previously mentioned, along with this upgraded terrain response setup, makes up the off-road aspect of the dynamic specification that I've been talking about. Is there a caveat to all this capability? 
only the one I've already alluded to, namely that the heavy duty 4x4 system my SDV6 test car is using here, the sophisticated one you'd find on a much pricier Range Rover, able to direct fully 100% torque to either axle. That's replaced by a cheaper Torsen system in the base TDV6 Sport model. That Torsen setup's far more limited, reacting to conditions that'll see it push a maximum of 62% of power to the front or up to 78% to the rear. And as I mentioned earlier, if you do get stuck, it can't be locked in the optimum 50-50 front to rear power split ratio that any other big Range Rover would use to ease itself out. Don't get me wrong, this simpler system is all most owners will ever want or need, and it's all other SUVs provide. But for me, a Land Rover product should be head and shoulders above all other SUVs when it comes to off-road access. The car I've got here proves that this Range Rover Sport very definitely can be. Imagine you were toned, fit, and nearly 20% lighter. How would you look? Sharper, smarter, younger, as indeed this car does in comparison to its boxy heavy predecessor. The faster windscreen angle, the streamlined profile and sloping roofline make it sleek and contemporary as it should be, a Range Rover Sport for a new era. But recognizably a Range Rover Sport. The clamshell bonnet, that floating roof, powerful wheel arches, and side fender vents that define this model are all present and correct. Up close, the S in SUV is further emphasized by the high belt line, short overhangs and distinctive silhouette. At the front, the slimmer LED lights and sculpted corners flank a classic two bar rearward sloping front grille executed to a theme reflected by the twin strakes of the fender vents. And there are bold trapezoidal shapes to house the central bumper beam and skid plate. A trapezoidal theme that's continued at the rear where the skid plate is flanked by a large twin exhaust. Not a car to be trifled with then. As we'll see in a minute, it's a much more spacious thing than before, though only 62 millimeters longer, which makes it all the more surprising that the Solihull engineers have been able to make it so much lighter. A modified version of the fully-fledged Range Rover aluminium monocoque chassis uh, accounts for most of the 420 kilograms that have been trimmed from a curb weight that now crucially pitches this car in at just over two tons rather than just under three. The aluminium approach is a trailblazing one in this class, but it's not enough to make this sport a car that could be in any way described as lightweight in the luxury SUV segment. Still, the fact that it's now no heavier than rivals like Porsche's Cayenne and BMW's X5, cars that don't need to carry around such sophisticated, bulky all wheel drive hardware, has to be seen as quite an achievement. So let's take a seat inside. Now, you'd be disappointed if you didn't have to climb up into a Range Rover. That's part of its appeal. The older folk can now ease the process by selecting the now lower access mode on models fitted with air suspension. Once installed on the generously bolstered seats, though, there's no mistaking that you're at the wheel of this British institutional model's younger, slightly smaller and much sportier twin. For a start, you sat a tad lower than you would be in a Range Rover, plus the more compact, thicker rimmed wheels, smaller, the upright gear sticks more purposeful, and the centre console higher. Perhaps that last point's the most significant as it positions the controls closer to you, creating a cocooning feel for the front seat occupants. Racy then, but still regal too. You're surrounded by simply acres of expensive materials. Here I've got ebony Oxford leather seats and ebony deep pile carpet to complement beautiful splashes of micro mesh aluminium veneer. Plenty of high tech too, some of it more effectively presented than others. Hard to dislike is the 12.3 inch TFT instrument screen offered on plusher versions that comes instead of the conventional dials you get on more affordable models. To replace these, the TFT approach offers lifelike digital facsimiles of the usual rev 
and speedo gauges. This just one of a range of customizable displays the panel can offer to suit your requirements. Off-road, for example, the rev counter can move aside in favour of a graphical drivetrain that shows which wheels are being driven, which diffs are locked, and much more. In fact, the virtual screen can be customised to show anything from the outside temperature to navigation information, uh, telephone system settings, or wheel articulation. Less clear and intuitive are the buttons on the steering wheel which control a range of electronic options in the centre dash display. You'll need to spend some time with your nose buried in the instruction manual to figure out both these and the infotainment system whose screen dominates the centre part of the dash and which by voice, touch or steering wheel button uh, marshals everything from sat nav to seat heating, stereo sound to surround cameras. Unfortunately, it requires much familiarisation and, in my opinion, too many button pushes to access some of its many functions. Four button presses to turn the heated seats off, for example. Some of the stuff it does is pretty smart, though. The 4x4 info display, for example, which shows you the state of play for everything from deactivating diff locks to driving into rivers. And I'm always impressed by Jaguar Land Rover's so-called dual view technology, which enables this 8-inch screen to simultaneously display a different image to driver and front seat passenger. So at the wheel, you can, say, view the navigation display while your passenger watches a video. Neat. And in the back, well, it's easier to get in for a start thanks to the wider door apertures and the lower seating position. And once inside, you'll find that the significant increase in wheelbase you get in this second generation Sport brings two main advantages with it. More rear seat space and potentially more rear seats. Settle yourself in the rear, and if you're familiar with a fully-fledged Range Rover, you'll find that a place in the back of this car is now nearly as nice. The reclinable bench, which can be optionally heated and cooled, and optionally uh, slid forwards and backwards, is wider more, and more comfortable, and provided you haven't taken the opportunity to slide it forward to increase luggage space, it offers up to 24 millimetres more knee room. Now the other reason you might want to slide this seat base forward is to free up extra room for third row occupants. Yes, you heard that right. Unlike its larger stablemate, this car can now be optionally specified as a seven-seater, the first time such a layout has been offered on any Land Rover. If, like I would be, you're thinking of ordering your car in this form, I should point out that, as you might expect, the extra chairs are really only for kids and short journeys. I'll raise the electrically operated tailgate, a one-piece hatch rather than the two-piece item you get on a fully-fledged Range Rover, and tell you that this particular Sport doesn't have these extra seats. I have to tell you that because there's no way you'd actually know this simply by glancing at the luggage area floor, under which the electrically raising extra chairs neatly reside when not in use. The optional full-size spare wheel also sits beneath this floor rather than untidily dangling below the chassis as it did on the old model. Impressive then that even if you specify both the extra chairs and the extra wheel, luggage capacity is unaffected at 784 litres. The need to accommodate both these features could however explain why this figure has fallen by 20% over the old model. Still, Land Rover had a bit of leeway here. Even as it is, this car offers nearly 20% more boot space than you get in rival BMW X5, Mercedes M-Class or Porsche Cayenne competitors. The X5 and the M-Class turn the tables when the rear seats are folded down. But even so, this Sport's 1,761 litre total should be more than adequate for most. Range Rover Sport pricing is pitched into the 50 to 85,000 pound bracket. If you're looking at the entry level TDV6 version, that's around 20,000 pounds less than a fully fledged Range Rover model with the same engine. It's not as simple as that, of course, because the specs of the two vehicles are quite different. But even if you equalize those, there's still quite a premium to pay to go from a TDV6 Range Rover Sport to a TDV6 version of the full fat Range Rover. 
The same applies in the unlikely event that you're looking at the 5 litre supercharged petrol V8 variant. Where this rule doesn't hold true is if you're comparing the Range Rover Sport with a Range Rover and V8 diesel level. Here, price-wise at least, there's not much between the two cars at all. But this could end up sounding complicated, so let me try and simplify things. Essentially, there are three kinds of Range Rover Sport you buy into. Let me loosely call these levels base, volume and nice to have. At the bottom of the lineup, you've got the base 258 PS TDV6 diesel. There is a £50,000 price leader, but to keep its cost competitive, lacking the most sophisticated on and off-road technology that really sets this car apart in its market. At the other extreme, there's the top of the range where you'll find the nice to have three most sophisticated engine options, all identically priced at just over £80,000 and all only offered in one top spec fully loaded form. Choose from diesel electric hybrid, SD V8 diesel and 5 litre V8 supercharged petrol. All very interesting, but let's get to the kind of Range Rover Sport almost all UK customers will choose, what I've called the volume level where you'll find the faster 292 PS SDV6 diesel, the car that I have here priced in the 60 to 75,000 pound bracket. Now it's not only that this engine offers the best all round choice in the range, though it does, it's also that this unit marks the starting point for what fans of the brand would probably call a proper Range Rover Sport engineering spec. So the heavy duty four wheel drive system that the base TDV6 uh, dispenses with is here restored. And from that starting point, there's then access to a whole series of extra cost, sophisticated on and off road technology that you simply can't order on the TDV6 model. In other words, if you want a version of this sport that shows everything the car can do, but does so without really breaking the bank, you'll have to have an SDV6. But which SDV6? After all, you really do have to get the technical spec of your car right. The standard version, as I've said, has a proper heavy duty four wheel drive system. One that, unlike the simpler Torsen setup in the cheaper TDV6 model, can direct fully 100% of torque to either axle. Now to build on that, you'll need one of the dynamic spec versions, which include both elements of what the company calls its on off road pack. The off-road bit includes a low-range twin-speed transfer gearbox and a set-and-forget auto setting for the terrain response system that will see the car always choosing exactly the right setup for the ground you're covering. The on-road aspect, meanwhile, adds torque vectoring to sharpen cornering, a dynamic response system to reduce body roll, and a dynamic program on the terrain response system that in one hit firms up the steering, sharpens the throttle response and quickens the gear shift times for press on driving. All this dynamic spec kit adds around £5,000 to the cost of a base HSE spec SDV6 model like the car I've got here. Alternatively, as I might be tempted to do, you can specify the off-road bit separately in a separate pack that adds just a few hundred pounds to the standard £60,000 price. So hopefully that's helped you arrive at the exact Range Rover Sport variant that's right for you. Before finally making up your mind though, you're going to want to know how this car really stacks up as a value proposition in its chosen segment. Pretty well is the answer. Let's start with the base TDV6 variant. Yes, it's been pitched in at around £3,000 above its most obvious three direct luxury SUV rivals, the BMW X5 xDrive 30D, the Mercedes ML350 Bluetech and the Porsche Cayenne diesel. But that's not really a significant premium at this level of the market. And it's certainly not enough to put you off buying this car if you really want one. I'd say that the BMW, the Mercedes and the Porsche echo this product's approach as sporty choices in this segment. But if that's not so important to you, then three other comparable competitors will offer you a six to seven thousand pounds saving over the base version of this car. Namely the three litre V6 TDI 245 PS versions of Volkswagen's Touareg and Audi's Q7 and if you're prepared to consider hybrid petrol power as an option to diesel, Lexus's RX 450H. 
You could even stretch the saving up to around £12,000 or so if you're prepared to consider the 250 PS version of Jeep's CRDI diesel Grand Cherokee. But then there are always savings to be made in any market segment if you're prepared to compromise on brand equity and core attributes. Moving up the Range Rover Sport lineup to consider the Pokia SDV6 diesel variant that I'm trying here, uh, that might help comfort potential buyers wanting one, but wondering why there's a £10,000 price premium over a directly comparable BMW X5 xDrive 40D. In fact, the 60 to 65,000 pound budget you'd need for this SDV6 would easily buy you a really fast V8 diesel in cars like the Porsche Cayenne, the Audi Q7 and the Volkswagen Touareg. But then none of these SUVs can match this one off-road and only the Porsche can approach its on tarmac capabilities. Plus, if you were to spec any of these German models up to match Land Rover's top autobiography spec, you probably wouldn't be too far off the asking price of just over £80,000 you'll need for a Range Rover Sport SDV8, a variant that comes with exclusive autobiography trim as standard. That only leaves the two other flagship versions of this car. Let's start with the hybrid version a model that takes the same diesel you'll find in this SDV6, mates it with a 35 kilowatt electric motor to create a variant that at launch was pretty unique in its market. True, at the time of this particular product's introduction, there were much cheaper hybrid versions of Porsche's Cayenne and Volkswagen's Touareg on sale in this segment. But these were cars that used thirsty petrol electric powertrains. Here at last, in the most eco-minded version of this Range Rover Sport, was a hybrid luxury SUV you could really justify running. Much tougher to justify are the running costs of the final Range Rover Sport variant we need to consider. The minority interest 5 litre V8 supercharged petrol model, really targeted at super rich American and Middle Eastern buyers. Like this SDV6, it's substantially undercut by a comparable BMW X5 model, in this case the X550i, but that's not quite as special a car. The two most obvious rivals that are will both cost you more. Around £3,000 more if the car in question is a Mercedes ML63 AMG, and around £8,000 more if the alternative is Porsche's KN Turbo. If, having considered all of these things, you conclude that it is a Range Rover Sport that you really, really want, then you're going to need to know what your investment is going to deliver in terms of standard equipment. And the answer is quite a lot, though on the base TDV6 version, you'd think that over £50,000 would buy you things like front fog lights, uh, carpet mats, a full-size spare wheel and gear shift paddles. Still, there's plenty else on the spec sheet, as well as core Range Rover Sport features like the terrain response off-road system and self-leveling air suspension. Even the least expensive model includes smart 19-inch alloy wheels, uh, auto headlamps and wipers, uh, a power tailgate, leather seats that are heated up front, a DAB digital radio, two-zone climate control, a volumetric alarm, an auto-dimming rear-view mirror, an HD satellite navigation with say-what-you-see voice control. I love the little touches too, like the hydrophobic coating you get on the front side door glass that helps it keep clear of droplets. As for options, well, you won't have to think too much about those if you go for the hybrid, the supercharged petrol model or the SDV8 diesel, as those three models all come fully loaded, but of course, very highly priced. At V6 diesel level though, where most will be buying, there are a few features that you'll probably want to consider. Three levels of Meridian stereo system are available, ranging up to a thumping 1700 watt 23 speaker 3D setup. Also tempting would be the luggage management system with its floor mounted rails, the huge panoramic glass roof and the timed climate control system so that you can set the cabin to be toasty warm when you climb aboard in the morning. I'd also like the cycle carrier that can take up to four bikes, the electrically deployable tow bar and the surround camera system with its five digital cameras providing an almost complete 360 degree view of the outside of the car. 
And if, like me, you have a family, I definitely suggest you tick the box for the third row seating option, which sees a couple of extra electrically retracting seats stowed beneath the floor of the luggage compartment. It's a feature you can't get on a fully fledged Range Rover, and in this class, it's something you can only otherwise get on a BMW X5 and an Audi Q7. As a family man, availability of this option is one of the important factors that would sell me this car. And high tech stuff? Well, no premium car can do without an integrated connectivity package these days. And Land Rover's connected car technology allows owners to check the status of their vehicles via an app they can install on their smartphones. This also provides support features such as stolen vehicle tracking and, if you should have a breakdown or an accident, emergency call and Land Rover Assist call. A high bandwidth Wi-Fi hotspot can be installed in the vehicle so that passengers can use the internet and get the best data connection for their smartphones or tablets. Other technical highlights include uh, an optional colour head-up display and a unique wade sensing feature that provides depth information when driving through water. And safety? Well, as you'd expect, all the usual elements are included. Isofix child seat fastenings, a pedestrian friendly bonnet, tire pressure monitoring, brake lights that flash in an emergency stop, and a whole bouncy castle quota of airbags. More specifically, as well as airbags for both front seat occupants, you get side, curtain and thorax airbags and an extended curtain airbag that covers passengers right back to the optional third row seating. Now hopefully you'll never need any of this, but to try and ensure that the worst never happens, there's a whole raft of electronic assistance features. On road, as well as the usual anti-lock brakes with EBA emergency brake assist, these include DSC Dynamic Stability Control, ETC Electronic Traction Control, EDC Engine Drag Torque Control, CBC Corner Brake Control, RSC Roll Stability Control, and if you need it, TSA Trailer Stability Assist. Off-road, you're more likely to use HSA Hill Start Assist to get you uh, up steep slopes, GRC Gradient Release Control to ease you over the summit, and HDC Hill Descent Control to help you down the other side. But of course, you can go further than that if you're prepared to spend a little more. A digital camera system supports lane departure warning to stop dozy drivers from veering out of their lanes on the highway. Traffic sign recognition, which pictures speed limit signs as you pass them and displays them on the dash, and automatic high beam assist, which automatically dips your high beam at night in the face of oncoming traffic. Another clever optional safety feature is flank guard, which helps alert the driver to potential impacts on the vehicle sides during tight manoeuvres in places like multi-storey car parks. I'd want to order it in conjunction with two extra features. First, the advanced park assist system, which can help you identify a space, then automatically steer you into it. And reverse traffic detection, which uses radar detectors in the rear of the car to warn about potential collisions during reversing manoeuvres, say when you're reversing out of a parking space. There's also an ACC adaptive cruise control setup that uses a radar to automatically keep you a perfect distance behind the car in front at motorway speeds and can even bring you to a stop and start you off again if you come upon a tailback. Plus, you might want to consider the blind spot monitoring system that'll stop you from dangerously pulling out to overtake when there's another car in your blind spot. When the very first Range Rover Sport was launched, buyers were faced with a choice. Reasonable performance or reasonable economy. You couldn't have both. How times have changed. Thanks to the fact that this is the first vehicle in its segment to feature an all aluminium body structure, a huge 39% weight reduction has been possible, enough to make a huge difference in running costs. Also helping in this regard are features like a plastic tailgate, aerodynamic underfloor panelling, electric power steering, a smart regenerative charging to reclaim energy that would otherwise be lost under braking or when cruising, 
and active vanes that blank off the front grille for better aerodynamics when cooling airflow isn't required. Stuck in traffic? Your sport will sense it. There's a transmission idle control setup that disengages 70% of drive when the vehicle is stationary with drive selected in a gearbox that in cold conditions will automatically choose a lower gear to more quickly get the engine up to its most efficient operating temperature. And as you'd expect, there's a stop-start system uh, to cut the engine when you're waiting at the lights or sitting in a queue. Finally, you'll find an eco driving feature on the central infotainment screen that'll rate your driving over any given journey. Compare your current and historical fuel returns and offer you useful tips on how you could improve the efficiency of your progress. So how much of a difference does it all make? Well, let me try and put that into perspective by using this volume 292 PS SDV6 model as an example. The original version of this car weighed 2,583 kilograms. This one weighs 2,115 kilograms. The original version returned 32.1 miles to the gallon on the combined cycle. This one manages 37.7 miles to the gallon. You get the idea. As for the CO2 emissions that'll determine your VED tax payments figure, well, they've improved from 230 to 199 grams per kilometre. Stretch to the hybrid model that mates this engine to an electric motor, and you can even get the return down as low as 169 grams per kilometre. The cheaper TDV6 diesel Range Rover Sport does, of course, do better than this SDV6, not only because it offers 34 PS less, but also because its simpler Torsen four-wheel drive system saves 18 kilograms of weight. Plus, of course, you're forced to do without the heavy-duty low-range gearbox option, which again piles off the pounds. Expect a TDV6 variant to manage 194 grams per kilometre of CO2 and 38.7 miles to the gallon. At the other diesel extreme, even the top 339 PS SDV8 model manages 229 grams per kilometre of CO2, and thanks to its increase in fuel tank size from 77 to 105 litres, will probably offer you a similar driving range to that of the V6 diesel variants. The top 5 litre V8 supercharged petrol model also shares that bigger tank. And it'll need it, because even though combined cycle fuel economy is 14% better than the original first generation supercharged version of this car, it's still only rated at 22.1 miles to the gallon, a figure I think you'd only achieve with a very frugal driving style indeed. What else? Insurance? The V6 diesels are rated between groups 43 and 45, but of course you'll pay more for a supercharged petrol variant pitched up at group 49. As for depreciation, well, you'll be expecting that to be significant. It always is with any luxury SUV. Those models in greatest demand, of course, shed less of their value. And this Range Rover Sport is in great demand from everyone uh, except, you might think, the Green Lobby. After all, in 2005, Greenpeace activists chained themselves to vehicles on the Solihull production line in protest. They shouldn't bother to do that now. Such have been the eco efforts made in this design. Up to 75% of the aluminium much of it is fashioned from is sourced from recycled content. And high-spec versions apparently use up to 26.7 kilograms of recycled plastics, which will divert over 11,800 tonnes of plastic from landfill during this car line's lifetime. Useful stats to have if you come across disapproving green-bearded folk. With the fully-fledged Range Rover, now a plutocratic purchase, it's this sport model that, for me, now most faithfully continues a model line stretching all the way back to the 1970 original. That very first Range Rover was a car you didn't have to be afraid to use as intended, on or off-road, and nor is this one. Get the fundamental thing right with any great design, in this case the weight, and everything else then tends to fall into place. The aluminium platform that here makes this car so much lighter 
solves at a stroke the two issues that blighted the first generation Range Rover Sport. Stodgy handling and high running costs. And yes, it does leave room for proper four-wheel drive hardware to be fitted without compromising paved road prowess, which is something that German rivals could learn from. True, it's a pity that the entry-level model does without some of the key on- and off-road features. And it's also necessary for potential customers to pay a little more than they would for some less sophisticated rivals, especially if they want to buy in at the SDV6 level that shows this car at its best. Still, the right version of this car offers exactly the right kind of luxury SUV experience for those fortunate enough to be able to enjoy it. A Range Rover Sport that at last is a proper Range Rover, that's sporty and that's a class leader. It's been a long time coming.